The Ultimate Success Secret by Dan S. Kennedy Introduction What you will discover in this book Why have I written a book with such an audacious title? It sometimes seems like only yesterday that I was a punk kid with big ideas, adding gray to my hair to try and look a little older. I certainly do not have that problem now. I could stand to take some of the gray out. After a speaking engagement not long ago, my friend Lee Milter observed that my groupies seem to be getting a lot older. Anyway, I feel like I've stacked up enough expensive experience to justify committing some opinions about the ultimate success secret to paper. I have gone from broke to well-off, from severe struggle peaks of success, in not one but three professional fields, and along the way, I have had a good fortune of working with hanging out with quite a number of exceptionally successful people from business, sports, entertainment. Famous people, like Joan Rivers, who started over after her husband's suicide and her loss of her career, working for $500 a week on Hollywood squares, pronounced a wash-up has been by her by her own agent, who reinvented her career and her life with courage and determination. And non-famous people like Gladie Hill, a 50-plus-year-old school teacher living uncomplainingly with Hodgkin's disease. On her summer vacations, climbing mountains, traversing Alaska in a jeep, at home, taking care of every imaginable orphan animal. At school, defying dollared administrators, to give her students the richest, imaginable learning experiences, thus earning the support of an entire community of parents and kids, and having a truly lasting impact on many lives. I have had the privilege of working closely with a great many from scratch entrepreneurs who've built empires, extraordinarily successful salespeople, top executives, top speakers. I have quite literally been surrounded by and immersed in success for years. And I'm a good observer. I have not let this go to waste. It is impossible to count the number of authors, researchers, psychologists, motivational gurus, etc., who have been fascinated by the question of what causes some people to be successful and others to fail. We know it is not environment, as some liberals insist. It cannot be. Because out of the very worst environments come fabulously successful individuals, repetitively enough not to be passed off as aberration. Blaming external factors and excusing a person's results because of external factors is not going to lead anybody to the answer to this question. In the United States, probably the most famous of authors to have attacked this question thoroughly was Napoleon Hill. His findings are summarized in his best-known book, Think and Grow Rich, a bestseller in its time, and, solely thanks to word of mouth, a steady seller, surviving and remaining on the fickle bookstore shelves for decades. In 1917, America's first billionaire, Andrew Carnegie, set Napoleon Hill on a mission to discover the commonalities the principles shared by hundreds of the most exceptional achievers of their time. Eventually, Hill arrived at 13 such principles. Recently, management guru Stephen Covey had a blockbuster best-selling book with his Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. My speaking colleague, Zig Ziglar, talks about the 10 qualities of successful achievers. 13, 10, 7, Pick a number. Well, I have the audacity to step forward and tell you that I've boiled it down to one. I changed the question to, Is there one single secret to success of such overriding importance that, if concentrated upon exclusively, will literally change a person's entire life experience and results? If so, what is it? That's right. One, I believe that I have identified the one single soul secret of success, universally shared and relied on above all other success secrets, 
by all extraordinarily successful individuals. And it is my contention that any person who discovers, accepts, comes to understands, and gives priority, paramount importance to this one secret, can and will quickly create unbelievable breakthroughs in his or her life. Incidentally, my focus has been quite different than Napoleon Hill's. I have paid a lot less attention to the thinking of the successful and paid a lot more attention to their behavior. In this book, I have not come out and simply stated the ultimate secret. Frankly, I could write it down on a 3 by 5 inch card. There are several reasons why I haven't done that. First of all, it's darn hard to get $19.95 for a 3 by 5 inch card. My accountant, Snarly Stubby Fingers, insists that we create things we can sell for profit. If I refuse, he swears, he'll up and leave, and he's the only one here with a combination to the safe where we keep the Oreos and a good scotch. Second, if I just tell it to you outright in its shortest form, it lacks useful impact. i found it is of little use to those I simply tell it to. On the other hand, those who ferret it out for themselves seem to place great value on it and get great value from it. So I hope you can discover this secret for yourself. It is waiting for you in a number of places in this book. I don't have any special reason to be overly mysterious though, so a clue. The spark that drove me to write this book may in itself be revealing. A very mundane event got me going. I had been thinking about writing a book on this particular subject for quite some time. I'd been assembling notes on it for a couple of years. But there was one little incident that got me to work. On a restless night, late at night, I was thumbing through TV Guide trying to find something to watch for an hour or so when I noticed this listing. Move! Action Jackson! That name instantly appealed to me. Who was Action Jackson? How did he earn such a dramatic nickname? Well, the movie turned out to be a bad B picture, a run of the mill cops and bad guys black exploitation film starring Carl Weathers. I would not recommend the movie. But the hero's name stuck in my mind long after the details of the movie faded. Action Jackson. That, I thought at the time, perfectly describes the kind of person who gets the most out of life. Think about some of the biggest blockbuster movies of recent years. Raiders of the Lost Ark, Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Batman, The Fugitive. Think about the enduring success of the James Bond series. Why have these films been such enormous box office moneymakers? I think one of the answers is the dramatic juxtaposition between the movies Always in Action Adventurers and most people's comparative slow-motion lives. The constant, the universal characteristic of such big-screen heroes is their bias for action. And for an hour or two, everybody becomes an action Jackson, living vicariously through these heroes. What the mediocre majority never learns is that they do not have to settle for living vicariously through others. Anybody can be an action Jackson, dive headlong into the greatest adventure of all, setting and rapidly accomplishing meaningful, worthwhile goals, meeting fascinating people, visiting exciting places, living an exciting life. Even people who are above average achievers are often guilty of seeing themselves in their own lives smaller than need be. Well, I am here to tell you that those who live life large do share a single ultimate secret. Through the stories, experiences, and examples I've assembled for you in this book, you can now discover that very secret and get it working for you. Dan Kennedy Chapter 1 Take Action to Escape from Prison Have you ever been inside a real prison? A friend of mine some years ago served one year in the Ohio State Penitentiary and I went to visit him frequently. I can tell you, nothing you see on TV or in the movies can even half prepare you for the shock of the real thing. 
I don't remember how many times I went inside and back out from behind those prison walls. But the awe, fear, disability, and depression I felt never lessened from the first time to the last. No description I could write could convey the powerlessness that came over me in that environment. There are millions of people enduring that environment every day. But that's a small number compared to the many millions of people who might as well be in such a prison for the little joy and satisfaction they are deriving from life. People build their own prisons, incarcerate themselves in them, and make the environments every bit as bleak, stark, depressing, and debilitating as the actual penitentiary I visited in Ohio. These people's private prisons block walls are constructed of complaints and resentments, the mortar from excuses, the bars forged from pessimism and procrastination. I might say that they are locked up in pity prison. Their sentence is indefinite and of their own making. They could walk out as a free man or woman at any time if they would just apply the ultimate secret of success. A word about heroes. As I finished the first edition of this book, the O.J. Simpson trial had sparked a national discussion of the relative wisdom or lack thereof of turning sports champions, entertainers, and other public celebrities into heroic role models. NBA star Charles Barkley publicly insisted athletes are not role models. Unfortunately, we cannot discourage countless young people from giving them hero status. The argument against viewing people as heroes based on their proclivity for making baskets, catching passes, packing concert halls, or delivering lines in movies is a good one, as too many seem to have an equal proclivity for squandering their status, money, and time on drugs, alcohol, epic sexual misbehavior, and violence. Actually, there are plenty of real heroes all around us. Yesterday, while killing time at the airport, I got my shoes shined. The lady doing the job, I guess about 35 or 36 years old, was finishing her second shift of the day with me at 6 p.m. Just as she was finishing, the payphone rang. As it turns out, her teenage daughter and son are required to call her every hour to check in. She is a divorced mother of two, a high school grad with very limited marketable job skills, doing a relatively tough job, compensated by tips, so the quality of her work, her attitude, her smile are critical. She is raising two teenagers, and she is saving up money to go back to school. I had to inquire and prod to find all this out. She was not complaining, not whining, not looking for pity. A real hero. After a speaking engagement in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I was eating dinner in the Holiday Inn restaurant. Seated several tables away, alone was a man about my age in a wheelchair. His hands were apparently of little use to him. He dined on a bowl of soup and a soft drink, both consumed through a straw. When the check was brought to him, he somehow produced his wallet. I didn't see how, and extracted dollar bills from it with his teeth. Here was a man settled with obvious shoulder-to-toes physical disabilities that made a simple journey to a restaurant difficult, tiring, possibly embarrassing. No one would criticize him for dropping out and copping out, but he refused to let his handicaps imprison him. A real hero. During a weekend in Las Vegas, I was leaving Caesar's place. The man getting his car from the valet ahead of me was also in a wheelchair. He and the valet knew each other and joked together as the man hoisted himself from his wheelchair into the car. The valet then left to retrieve my car. I walked over and asked the man if he would like help getting his wheelchair into his car. Thanks, he said, but it's not necessary. I've been doing this for myself for 30 years, and I'm thankful that I can. One-handed, he folded up the wheelchair, pulled it into the car behind him, slid across the seat, and drove off. He too refused to be imprisoned by his handicap. A real hero. 
I had reason to recall these two instances and individuals recently, as my dad had a reoccurrence of an unusual neurological condition that put him flat on his back in the hospital, unable to sit up by himself, feed himself, stand, walk, or do much of anything else. His doctors did their best to convince him that he, at best, might not go beyond being helped into a wheelchair. He set goals for regaining leg strength and balance, then for control of the upper body, then for feeding himself, then for dressing himself, then he moved from hospital to long-term care facility, today's euphemism for nursing home. Then he set goals for walking, for dressing himself, and finally, he got into his own car and drove himself to his apartment. Then he came back to work at the office. I once had a blind man in a sales organization I managed. He had not been blind at birth but had lost his sight in his late teens. He worked with his wife in our business, and he was an enthusiastic, effective salesperson. He told me a favorite pastime was washing and wa- waxing his car at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, in the dark. It didn't matter to him, but it sure bugged his neighbors. He, I asked him how it was that he had avoided bitterness or self-pity. He told me, Very early on, I got to meet and talk with many other blind people, and I realized that many had let their lack of sight ruin their lives. They built little prisons for themselves and locked themselves in. I was determined not to do that. A real hero. Each of these individuals' lives demonstrate that positive attitudes and actions, even in the most negative of circumstances, can make a big difference. Who else is afraid of public speaking? Phobias are real. I've had the privileges of working with Florence Henderson on a couple of TV projects and gotten to know her. Did you know that, following the cancellation of the Brady Bunch, her career dried up and her fear of flying rose up and dominated her, crippling her pursuit of career opportunities because she could not get on an airplane? Barbara Streisand stopped doing concerts thanks to uncontrollable stage fright. Johnny Carson reportedly suffered from incredible anxiety before every show. A comedian I know well, who I won't name, has such severe stage fright he vomits before most performances. But there's not a phobia on earth that can't be treated, conquered, controlled. Who's afraid of speaking in public? Just about everybody. Several surveys have shown that more people fear public speaking than fear heights, snakes, serious illness, accidental death, or financial failure. One survey of Fortune 1000 executives revealed speaking to groups as their number one fear. I've been fortunate to earn a large income from speaking. As my career progressed, from a few thousand dollars to $50,000 and up from each speech. But if you went back to the time in my childhood when I stuttered almost uncontrollably, when I could turn one short sentence into one long seminar, who would have predicted this career for me? Although the problem lessened as I matured, to this day, I am still at risk of getting hung up on a word, starting to stutter, embarrassing myself on stage, on the phone, or in conversation. Was it smart to choose careers in selling and speaking? Who would have blamed me for letting this influence my career choices? I refuse to do that. My friends, John and Greg Rice, were imprisoned by their midget size until a man by the name of Glenn Turner got hold of them. John and Greg can't reach all the elevator buttons without something to stand on, and Glenn Turner was the first person to tell them that even little men could do big things. John and Greg have become very popular motivational speakers on the subject of thinking big, even though they have to climb up onto a table so the audience can see them. They achieved considerable success as real estate salesmen, even though they had to ask their customers to describe the things above sink level that they couldn't see. They've been featured on countless TV programs and in movies, built a sizable real estate investment business, and live a top-quality lifestyle in sunny Florida. For every handicap, 
obstacle and tragedy, there are two stories. Go ahead, name a handicap. Born and raised in a ghetto as a latchkey kid, then surrounded by gangs, crime, drugs, a physical handicap, a crippling accident, a terrible disease, illiteracy, lack of education, a speech impediment, severe phobia. Name the handicap. There are two stories to be found for every one you can think of. Story number one, unfortunately the most common, will be of people who've let that handicap imprison them. Story number two will be of the person who has accomplished the most extraordinary things in spite of, in some cases because of, that very same handicap. Each individual, by his or her actions, chooses which story will be theirs. And the chapter ends with a saying, It's an impossible situation, but it has possibilities. By Sam Goldwyn. Chapter 2. Take action to take charge of every aspect of your life. Once driving from Cincinnati, Ohio to St. Louis, Missouri to fight boredom, I was listening to a radio call-in show hosted by a lady psychologist. I no longer remember her name or the name of the caller, but I certainly remember the conversation. The caller, a woman, 40 years old, in her second marriage, spilled out a load of unhappiness and misery. Her husband didn't pay enough attention to her. Her kids were grown and no longer needed her. She was bored. Finally, the host stopped her and said, You will continue to be unhappy as long as you depend so much on others to make you happy. I pulled the car off to the side of the road and jotted that down as a fill-in-the-blank formula. You will continue to be on blank as long as you depend on others to make you blank. Then I wrote down a few examples. You will continue to be unimportant as long as you depend on others to make you feel important. You will continue to be unprosperous as long as you depend on others to make you prosperous. You will continue to be uninspired as long as you depend on others to make you inspired. The Miracle Formula for Taking Charge of Every Aspect of Your Life Let me tell you how this miracle formula came to me. The very first seminar I ever attended, now more than 25 years ago, where success concepts were presented, was a real eye-opener for me. The speaker talked about what he called the most unpleasant success principle in the world. Well, who wants to hear about the most unpleasant anything? But I was there, so I listened. He said repeatedly, You are exactly where you really want to be. Now, let me tell you where I was. I had driven to the seminar in a 1960 Chevy Impala, and it was not 1960. When it rained, this sad old car leaked from the top and from the bottom. The seats never dried out. They stayed musky damp in the summer. They froze and cracked in the winter. The car's frame was broken clear through, so its rear end was held up with a contraption of bailing wire, wood, wood blocks, and a turnbuckle. But there was no shame for this car. I paid just $25 for it, on payments, and it was all I could afford at the time. And the condition of the car was symbolic of a few other aspects of my life. So when that speaker said, you are exactly where you want to be. Hey, I didn't like that very much. It took me a while to stop arguing and start thinking. Then I finally, re finally wrote down a formula from what I thought about as a result of his statement. I could give it to you on the back of a matchbook. It doesn't require a whole book to give you this. But don't let that diminish its importance. It is my non-humble opinion that this painfully arrived at formula has truly profound importance. Here it is. Control equals responsibility. Responsibility equals control. Everybody wants more control. If you take all your personal career, financial, and other goals, everything you think you want out of life, and boil all that down to a single overriding objective, it is a desire for greater control. Greater control over finances, 
present and future. Greater control over your time and lifestyle. Greater control over your kids, etc. Ironically, as much as we desire greater control, we are the ones to give it all away. Every time we say, it's the location of our business, it's the season, it's the economy, it's the supervisor who has it in for me, it's the way I was brought up, it's my partner, co-worker, spouse, it's blank. Each and every time we say, it's the, we really do two things simultaneously. One, we push away a small weight of responsibility, and that temporarily makes us feel better. But two, we give, we give up and an equal-sized amount of control. Whenever we deny responsibility, we give up control. Get rid of a pound of responsibility, lose a pound's worth of control. The Miracle Formula in Action Why does one person prosper and another suffer? I happen to know two people very well who are very much alike. They own two almost identical businesses. Their businesses are in neighboring, very similar towns. My observation is that they are equally skilled in the technical and administrative aspects of their business. One, Peter E., has struggled for about seven years just to stay in business. He has gained very little, if any, financial ground during those years. His life is a day-to-day struggle for survival. The other fellow, Robert L., started six years ago. His business has grown by 10% to as much as 30% each year, every year. He is now getting ready to turn it into a fortune through franchising. When I talk with Peter E., I hear a lengthy discourse on all the outside influences that negatively affect his business. The economy, taxes, banks that won't give him small business a fair shake, competition from huge corporations, and his list goes on and on and on. Every time I talk with Peter, I hear the same list, a broken record playing over and over again. I acknowledge, by the way, that these factors do exist. I am frustrated by some of them myself. But the issue is not the existence of these factors. The issue is how much control Peter lets them have over his business. Every time Peter recites his list, He shuffles off responsibility for his situation, and that temporarily helps him feel better. But with the responsibility goes the control. When I talk with Robert, these matters only occasionally come up. Instead, he talks excitedly about the innovative strategies he has discovered and developed to keep his business growing regardless of external influences. He exhibits healthy curiosity and quizzes me about strategies. I've seen or discovered recently that might work for him. How does that client of yours in X business deal with this Y problem? He wants to know. Often, he'll say something like, I really screwed up on this situation. Let me tell you about the base I missed and what I'm doing about it. Robert accepts all the responsibility for his success or failure, his errors and his achievements, and because he does, he retains control. Only 5% exhibit self-reliant behavior. A couple years ago, I did a speaking tour of all the CEO clubs in the country for Joe Mancuso's Center for Entrepreneurial Management, and I talked with groups of corporate presidents in nearly a dozen different cities. If I heard it from one CEO, I heard it from a dozen. It's getting harder and harder to find worthy people to promote from within. Why is that, I asked. Only about 5% of all the people we employ consistently exhibit self-reliant behavior. What do you mean by self-reliant behavior? One president answered this way. Well, take the typists here in the office. They know that a proofreader checks their work for errors, so they rely on her rather than bothering to check their own work and consistently present her with typing done right the first time. Then we've got 50 sales reps in the field. Accounting has to constantly chase and nag every one of them to get their paperwork. My sales manager told me the other day that we've got one guy who we give wake-up calls to. Another president said, We have about 20 people in the Chicago plant. Only three or four consistently get here on time, ready to work. I figured about 5% of all the people we've ever employed in all the different jobs 
accept full responsibility for successful completion of every aspect of their jobs. When you think through what these CEOs said, you have a simple answer to a long list of questions. How can I move ahead in my career? How can I get a better job? How can I start my own business? How can I have a better relationship? How can I maintain a positive outlook? How can I make more money? Most people have unsaid extensions to these kinds of questions. How can I move ahead in my career when others have more education than I do? When the boss likes Steve better than me? How can I get a better job when the economy is so bad? How can I start my own business when I haven't got any money? And so on. The answer to these questions and many more like them is self-reliant behavior. How long will you wait before taking charge? The many times that I follow General Schwarzkopf on a program, I listened as he posed this rhetorical question. If you are put in charge, when you are put in charge, what should you do? Take charge. He was talking about the very essence of leadership. Not waiting, not procrastinating, not looking around to copy how others did it or are doing it, not waiting for a committee to cover your butt with its recommendations. Instead, stepping forward to do what needs to be done and to do what is right. All too often, even when an individual finally gets the chance to be in charge that he has coveted, he accomplishes little. For years, other players on the NBA Chicago Bulls grumbled and groused about being stuck in the shadow of Michael Jordan. They coveted the chance to command that spotlight and lead the team. But when Michael Jordan retired, that spotlight searched vainly for that team's next leader. In 1994, it couldn't find one. The most logical heir apparent embarrassed himself and his entire team in the playoffs by throwing a hissy fit over not being named by the coach as the man to get the ball and try the final shot in the final seconds of a closely contested playoff game. This would-be leader let his ego control his actions. Incredibly, he refused to go back in from the time out and give his best efforts to the play that had been called. You can look around and see such individuals squandering their opportunities constantly in just this way. But I would go even farther. Why wait until you are put in charge? Take charge anyway. The fact is, there's a leadership vacuum just about everywhere. Maybe in your home, probably in your business or place of employment, in your industry, in your community, in your church, in your country. And I suggest this leadership vacuum offers you the opportunity to seek to change your life for the better. Let me give you a very down-to-earth example. Mary S. Was at, a sem- was at a seminar I presented for doctors some years ago. She was there with her husband, a dentist. She pulled me aside on a break. Could I talk to you alone for a minute? So she and I ducked out of the meeting room, went to the hall, and found an empty room to step into. I'm so frustrated, she told me. There are so many things you've been talking about that we could do to build up the practice. We keep going to seminars, hearing good ideas, but my husband never gets anything new implemented. Nothing happens. The staff now knows that when he comes back from a seminar talking about new ideas, all they have to do is wait a few days and it'll all blow over. And the practice hasn't grown a bit in three years. What kind of things would you have him do, I asked. Join the Chamber of Commerce, attend meetings, and make contacts with other business people in the community, she said. And start a mailing campaign to area business owners and executives. And put out a monthly newsletter for our past and present patients. And put together a little how-to book, something like How to Keep Healthy Teeth for Life. And in the office, our reception area desperately needs redecorated. The staff needs some help with handling telephone calls telephone calls, especially from new patients calling in because of our Yellow Pages ad. And, wait a minute, I raised my hand like a traffic cop and brought her to a halt. Mary, these all sounds like inarguably good ideas to me. But he won't do any of them, she said sadly. Well, Mary, I asked, what are you waiting for? For the first time that night, 
Mary was speechless. She returned to the meeting room with a particularly thoughtful look on her face. You see, it's one thing to complain about another person's failure to pick up the ball and run with it. In this case, Mary was certainly justified in being frustrated with her husband's lack of ambition and initiative. But she'd been complaining to him about him for three years. She'd been frustrated for three years. Obviously, that wasn't going to change anything. Her only apparent options, accept him and things exactly as is, and stop being aggravated. Continue being frustrated every day of her life for the rest of her life, divorce him and leave, or pick up the ball and do something running of her own. Most would choose one of the first two options. Thoriu observed, Most men and women lead lives of quiet desperation. About a year later, Mary S. appeared at another of my many seminars for doctors. Again, she cornered me on a break, apart from her husband. I want to tell you, she began, that I was very angry with you and the way you answered me that night. I wanted some sympathy, and I wanted you to give a tough talk with my husband, but I sure didn't want you to challenge me. Should I apologize? I asked. Hardly, she answered. Let me tell you about my new life. Mary no longer worked in the office as a dental assistant. <clears throat> Instead, she had hired her replacement, then appointed herself director of marketing. She joined the Chamber of Commerce, a business women's club, a Toastmasters group, and enrolled in a Dale, Dale Carnegie class. She assembled a book, Secrets of a Healthy Smile for Life, and she began speaking to groups of school children, PTA meetings, civic groups, everywhere she could on behalf of the practice. She put together a practice newsletter, assigned writing tasks to other staff members, and occasionally even to patients, got it done, published, and out every month. She designed a new family plan to promote to the patients, which the practice is patients. She created and promoted patient appreciation weeks. In five months, the practice doubled. Although shocked at first, her husband adopted to her new role and new interests, and he was kept pretty busy just handling the new patient flow anyway. Now I work just three or four hours a day, doing all the marketing and promotion for the practice. I'm our Mrs. Outside. He's our Mr. Inside. And I've even got time for my new venture, creating and publishing health-related health coloring books for kids distributed through dentists nationwide. I'm not waiting anymore, she concluded. Now... What are you waiting for? The chapter ends with a quote from Earl Nightingale. Are you pleased with your present place in the world? If your answer is yes, what's your next port of call? If your answer is no, what are you going to do about it? By Earl Nightingale. Chapter 3. Take action to get the know-how you need. Not knowing how to do something has never stopped me from setting out to do it, and I've become convinced that anybody can become competent, even expert, at just about anything. There are books, cassettes, courses, classes, teachers, mentors, newsletters, associations, an absolute abundance of information linked to virtually any and every skill or ability or occupation you can think of. A whole lot of it is readily available, free. More at very modest cost, some pricey. I am frequently amazed and dismayed at the people who seek me out and ask questions that evidence that they haven't even done an ounce of homework or research on their own. Today, a business owner came to me after I finished delivering a speech on advertising and marketing, handed me the advertising flyer he'd prepared and invested his hard-earned money in having printed and distributed and said, what do you think? I had a few questions of my own. Before you put this together, I said, what books did you go and get about writing and get about writing advertising headlines? About advertising in general? And I could have asked a dozen more questions along these same lines. The answers were frankly pitiful, non existent. He had done nothing, nada, zero to prepare himself for the task of putting together effective advertising flyers. 
When you look at this objectively from the outside in, it's pretty obvious that this is stupid behavior. And quite bluntly, if you insist on behaving stupidly, you do not deserve positive results. Ignorance about any particular subject is forgivable and fortunately fixable. Stupidity is another story altogether. The Serious Student at Work When I became earnest about using more humor in my speeches and seminars and getting good at using it, for example, I found no shortage of assistance out there. Beyond simply observing and analyzing great humorists and comedians, I found plenty of books on the subject. ESAR's comic encyclopedia, videos, seminars, newsletters, and audio cassette courses. I learned timing from listening to a fantastic humorous speaker, Dr. Charles Jarvis, from comedian Shelley Berman, and others over and over and over again. I read all the classic masters. Benchley, Thurber, I read all the contemporary humorists. I read everything Steve Allen ever wrote. I found old comedy records. I subscribed to humor services like Orbens. I became a very serious student of humor. Gradually, I transitioned from pick- picking and telling jokes to creating original material, from jokes to humorous stories. I did a whole lot of homework. When I got involved in teaching advertising, marketing, and sales to doctors of chiropractic, I became a serious student of the chiropractic profession. I subscribed to the profession's journals, I got and read books, I visited the offices, I went to seminars, I asked questions of doctors. In a few months, I knew enough and sounded so much like a chiropractor that we had to continually correct doctors who came or who called me Dr. Kennedy and convinced themselves I was one of them. To this day, I'll be walking through a hotel, lobby, airport, mall, and have a chiropractor yell out, Hello, Dr. Kennedy. And although I would never give an adjustment, I can do a decent exam, a good report of findings, I can sell people on chiropractic better than most chiropractors, and I could operate a practice. I could go to a convention and easily pass myself off as a doctor if I chose to. I'll bet I could go to an office and get myself hired as an associate doctor. Some years back, I worked closely with a client in the retail theft control business. His company dealt with employee and delivery man theft in supermarkets, convenience stores, and drugstores. Then I subscribed to all the trade journals of the supermarket, convenience store, and drugstore industry and assembled articles about theft from several years of back issues. I read what books I could find on the subject. I studied my client's materials. I learned the language of retail finance. To this day, I can walk into any such store or restaurant and in five minutes tell you whether or not the employees are stealing. And if so, show you the hidden evidence that proves it. And I could give a seminar to retailers on the subject and no one would question my status as an expert. I'm not bragging. I'm just pointing out that it isn't very difficult to quickly acquire expertise in a given area if that's what you want to do. But it's amazing to me the number of people who just never bother. When I worked with the chiropractors, I used to ask groups for a show of hands how many had really studied even one book or course on how to sell. In most groups, less than half. Yet, every day, their incomes depend on their effectiveness at selling. Selling the public and new prospective patients on chiropractic selling new patients their recommendations and their fees. They're not alone. Just about every business or occupation is a composite of several different types of expertise. But most people master one and are content being an amateur in the others. If not knowing about something stands between you and what you want to accomplish, get busy and go get that know-how. It really is that simple. The seven ways to get smarter about virtually any subject, fast. Number one, find and read at least a year's back issues of the related trade or specialty magazines. Every business, industry, occupation, vocation, hobby, or special interest, from cooking to computer programming, from ostrich farming to searching for lost gold mines, 
from long-haul truck driving to golfing, from writing to woodworking, from astrology to zoology, has won, in most cases, several magazines all its own. In these magazines, the experts write articles, are interviewed and profiled, how-to secrets are revealed, advertisers promote their wares. Number two, answer a lot of the ads you find in these magazines. Let all those advertisers try to sell you their products and services. Soon, you'll be deluged with information, all coming to you, free. Number three, find the top experts, most successful people and most celebrated people in the field. Such people have probably written books, recorded audio cassettes. They may sell such products, seminars, or consulting, and or they may even be approachable just to talk with or visit with free. Seek out the best and the brightest and find out how you can best turn their experience into your knowledge. Surprisingly, even in competitive fields, these outspoken experts and super achievers exist. Some years back, I worked with a chiropractor who started his own practice immediately after school. Almost immediately. First, armed with a list he had painstakingly compiled of 50 of the most successful, most respected chiropractors in the country, he got in his car and drove across country, north, south, east, and west, going to each of their offices, asking if he could observe, take the doctor to lunch or dinner and pick his brain, visit with the staff, and so on. 49 of the 50 were gracious, generous, encouraging, and helpful. He arrived home with what he called a master practice, building plan from the masters of the profession. He had great confidence in this plan. He implemented it with natural enthusiasm and positive expectation, and he built a record-breaking practice in short order. If I were to start in a brand new business today, I would follow his example. Number four. Find the books written by the old masters. Just about every field has old masters, whose works are hard to find or even out of print, who many ignore as passed by time and no longer important. They're wrong. In the selling field, every salesperson should read books by Frank Betger, Red Motley, Robert Traylins, to name a few, from the 1950s to 1940s and earlier if you can find them. Robert Trellin's old book, Dynamic Selling, published by Prentice Hall a long time ago to be found only in libraries or used bookstores, offers better advice on crafting powerful appointment-getting presentations than any book, seminar, or course I am aware of. In direct response advertising and copywriting, today's top pros like my friends Gary Halbert and Ted Nicholas and I constantly refer novices to the works of the old masters, Robert Collier, Claude Hopkins, Victor Schwab, and others dating back to the 1930s. I would add, of course, a suggestion that you read my books, and I'm reluctant to say it, but I'm reaching the old master status. For selling, read my No BS Sales Success book. For marketing, read No BS Direct Marketing for Non-Direct Marketing Businesses, as well as the Ultimate Marketing Plan. And The Ultimate Sales Letter. For entrepreneurship, read No BS Business Success and No BS Wealth Attraction for Entrepreneurs. They're all readily available at bookstores. Number five, join trade associations or clubs. The learning curve shortcuts available through trade association memberships and attending association conventions and workshops is remarkable. The opportunity to make dozens and dozens of important and beneficial contracts is even greater. Most associations have archives of tapes from past years' convention and workshops, so you can attend two, five, even ten years of past events as if a time machine was at your disposal. Many national associations have state, regional, or city chapters with easily accessible meetings and seminars, usually all at very modest costs. If you're Interested in writing, for example, the National Writers Club has chapters in most states. If you are interested in speaking, the National Speakers Association has chapters in many cities. At Glazer Kennedy Inner Circle, 
we now have local chapters and coaching groups, and you can find information about them at dankennedy.com. If you receive this book from a business expert in a particular field, he may offer options for coaching and mastermind groups to join as well. Number six, take a class, workshop, or seminar. Community colleges are getting more and more progressive and competitive in their class offerings and their use of bona fide real-world experts as instructors. The seminar organization, The Learning Annex, with operations in many major cities, offers the, more, the most diverse assortment of classes I've ever seen. Everything from how to start an import-export business to how to become a belly dancer or how to strip like a pro or how to buy and sell antiques. Somewhere, there's somebody giving a class, workshop, or seminar on just about any subject you might imagine. There is, for example, a bona fide expert who takes a few people at a time fishing for a week at a hefty $5,000 a pulp and teaches them how to or how fish think so that they can more easily catch more fish. Laugh if you will, but he is for real and was the subject of a very successful TV infomercial, Outdoor Challenge, hosted by Kurt Gaudi, produced by my friend Pam Daly, for which I wrote the commercials. My friend Jerry Patterson has hundreds of loyal, happy students at his periodic casino gaming conventions where he teaches his blackjack methods. One great source of information about top quality seminars and conferences in different fields is www.renegademillionairemarketing.com. Number 7. Do your homework. The public library is the place to start. Most major city libraries have, have self-serve, easy-to-use computer systems, so you can plug in any topic and find all the books, articles, and other resources related to it. There is a master directory published for every imaginable subject. And if you can't find one in your area of interest, there is a directory of directories to help you.